thank you. Any trouble from you? You're out. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, my my group at um, the group I work with at Hertfordshire and the group I work with at Bacconi, um t- together we're the we're just about the only academic research group in the world that is studying um, the evolution of the industry and in particular um, one aspect of that is the acquisition of market access capabilities. So we're a very unusual specialised group in that sense and most of our researchers are people who work in the industry who know it because as the leader of the group I take the view that you can't really understand the industry unless you've worked in it to some extent. So it's not sort of academic study in the industry, it's people who work in the industry being forced to go through academic rigour. And there's an old joke about academics that if you, if you laid them, if you took all the academics in the world and laid them end to end, they still wouldn't reach a practical conclusion. Okay? So I'm going to try and disprove that tonight by giving you some of the findings of our work um, in such a way that you can take it home to the office or take it back to the office and use it in a, a practical, applied way. So let's try and do that. Um, I've been on the same presentation skills courses that you've been on. Um, so this is the tell them what you're going to tell them slide. Okay. Um, roughly speaking, that this evening is split into three roughly equal thirds um, of about 20 to 30 minutes each. The first third, uh, I apologise, is going to be the lecture part and then we'll move into the, the, the two parts of the, the, the workshop part. Um, and in this first, first part, I'm going to try and get agreement and show, show you our work in developing the idea of the definition of what market access strategy is. Because, as Voltaire said, you know, if you wish to converse with me, first define your terms. If, if I'm saying market access and I mean one thing and you're saying market access and mean another thing, then we're going to have a fairly sterile discussion, aren't we? And I'm also going to try and um, show you our work there about um, the differences between strong and weak market access strategies. What is, what, how do you measure the differences between strong and weak? And what are those differences? So that'll be the first part. Then we'll go into the, um, the workshop part of it where I'm going to try and ask you to apply it to a, a case study. And I'm going to ask you to apply it to the most relevant and useful case study you can apply to. And um, perhaps I shouldn't say this as, a, as an academic, but there is only one case study that is relevant in, to, to, to your business, which is your business, because every other business is different. So I'm going to ask you to apply to a brand that you're familiar with. So we're going to apply that and then after that, the final third, we'll have a discussion about the implications of that work and what it means and how it works. And if we've got time, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the broader context of the work because having done this work, the next question we're asking is, why are firms, pharmaceutical and medtech firms, why are they relatively weak and relatively slow at developing market access capabilities? Okay. So that's what we'll do. So that's the, the plan for this evening. So I'll pause slightly for a moment there so you can sneak out the back door if you're not interested. But this is what we're going to cover. I started my research by going to lots and lots and lots of very senior executives who ran market access for lots of big companies in pharma and in medtech. And this is just, just one quote from one of them. We have 10,000 people in an organisation and at least that many definitions of what market access strategy is. You all know this firm. If I told you the name of it, you were all going, hey, really? Them? But... To save embarrassment, I'm not going to tell you who it was. The interesting thing is that you ask all of these managers and they all give you a weak definition. And I don't mean that in a, in a sense of I didn't like the definition. I mean it in the sense of a definition which did not pass the tests of a strong definition. Good definitions are inclusive, exclusive, descriptive, non-circular, as the slide says. And they all gave waffly vague definitions. We're still, when you, as in this kind of research, there's what's called single respondent bias. You never do research by going into a company and asking a person, because you may get someone with an odd point of view. You ask multiple people within the organisation. And when you ask multiple people within the organisations, you get lots more definitions, and they never agree, and they often contradict. So that's a bit scary. But the research didn't stop there. There was a positive side to this. It's because... Even though these definitions were varied and they were weak and waffly and contradictory, it's a little bit like being a detective at the scene of a, a, crime, a crime scene. Because if you speak to enough witnesses and if you know the context and the background and you know some background information, you can piece together things and get the story from them. And that's effectively what we did, as I'll talk about in a moment. 
So we piece together all of these umpteen definitions. And the first thing that emerges is that you have to understand, of course, that strategy is a cascade process. The definition of strategy is a sustained pattern of resource allocation decisions. And when organisations make strategy, they do it in a cascade. They start with the decisions about which market should we be in and which, which industries should we operate in. That's corporate strategy. Most of us in this room are not concerned with that. It's made, that strategy is made by people way above us. That cascades down once it's made to the next strategy to make is, is business unit strategy, which is resource allocation between parts of the market. So which therapy areas, for instance, will, will be involved in. And also, how will we allocate resources across the value chain? So will we be a research-based co led company or a, a, a customer interest company or a, um, a company that focuses on operational excellence? Those of you who've done an MBA will hear echoes they were port as generic strategies. That's what he was talking about there. And then the level below that, once the business unit strategy is made, is the marketing strategy. That's resource allocation between markets within a segment and resource allocation between different aspects of value. Not to be confused with marketing communication strategy, which is a different lower level strategy. Below marketing strategy lies market access strategy and all of the other functional strategies, things like marketing communication strategies and medical affairs strategy and so on. And market access strategy is that, that set of resource allocation decisions about what health economic value proposition to make and how to allocate resources between the decision makers within the market access decision. Talk a little bit about more on in a second. And that, of course, cascades down all of these things like th that we would call market access tactics, like the clinical claims you make, the health economic claims you can make, the pricing level, the pricing structure, your, your advocacy process, how you work with patient advocacy groups and so on. The definitions of market access strategy is quite often, when you ask them to talk about market access strategy, they're not talking about market access strategy, they're talking about market access tactics, the tactical pattern. So this understanding of what market access strategy was and um, where it fits into the cascade of, of strategic decision making within an organisation was I think the first um, finding, the first contribution that our, to knowledge that our research made. You know, as an academic we're always judged by our contribution to knowledge and practice. But of course this still isn't a, a good definition of market access strategy. It just still doesn't meet the criteria of a strong definition of market access strategy. <coughs> So to do that, of course, we had to say, well, what do we mean by market access and what do we mean by strategy and then put the two together. So again, coming out of the research, analysing what everybody said, piecing it together, looking for the common areas of overlap, we came up with a definition of market access strategy as it's a, market access is a situation. It's a situation where, in short, the payers agree to make the product available to the patients. And there's a very large degree of commonality of agreement so we, we in, in the interviews about that so we took the data we looked at it we put it together in a form of words we took it back to the interviewees and said yeah that's what we mean by market access strategy by, by market access and then that led us to what market access strategy means and market access strategy we we, confirm, we concluded was a functional level strategy so that second bottom layer in that diagram i just showed you and it's that sustained pattern of resource allocations allocation decisions made with the goal of achieving market access and involving activity decisions about what health economic value proposition to make to the market and which audiences within the market access decision making process to whom to address that proposition. Now it might sound a bit wordy but it's necessary to be wordy to get a strong definition which is inclusive, exclusive, descriptive and, and non-circular. This one passes all of those tests and it was well received by the people we took it back to. As far as I know, this is the only published, by which I mean peer-reviewed, published peer-reviewed definition of market access and market strategy that exists. Yeah. There are lots, of course, in every company. They might say market access is this, and they might talk about market access strategy. This is the only peer-reviewed published one that I know of. And it's even been adopted by ISPO, which is the medical device, European medical device, um, group that works on that now. So defining what market access strategy was, was I think our second 
contribution to knowledge, our second finding. But then, of course, everything, the thing about all good research, of course, is whatever you find out, just open, you answer one question and you, you ask another 20 questions. And that led us onto this issue of, well, if that's what market access strategy is, then what is the difference between a strong market access strategy and a weak market access strategy? And this methodologically is really, really problematic because, of course, your first instinct is, well, a market access strategy is one that makes you lots of money, isn't it? That is commercially successful. But that doesn't work because, of course, commercial success is multifactorial. There are many, many, many things that lead to commercial success. How good your molecule is, how strong your sales force was, what resource you had, how bad your competition is. So you can't simply say a good market access strategy is one which achieves commercial success. And the other thing that we found is that market access strategies turn out to be not binary, like good or bad, but they turn out to be like people. You know, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses, don't we? Um, so we started to ask this cascade of questions, and as we went through it, we realised that actually what is a good market access strategy is not the right question. The question is, what are the dimensions or the parameters by, that you can measure or assess or judge by which you can differentiate between a strong market access strategy and a weak market access strategy? Does that make sense? Okay. What are the things you can measure? Okay. So if I asked you to measure the, the quality of anything else, you know, a glass of wine that you've just had there today, you wouldn't say good wine, bad wine. You would probably have two or three parameters by which you measured it. And we asked this cascade of questions about, well, what is your market access strategy? How well does it work? What, what works well? What doesn't work? Um, what do good ones look like? What do weak ones look like? And we asked this of multiple companies and we, we put them together. And there was lots of overlap between them, some differences, some confusion, but we stitched them all together like, a, like a, a detective at a crime scene. And what comes out of it is this. Now there's too much on this slide. Any person who taught me presentation skills would scream at this slide, of course, is far too much. But we're going to be going through this in the workshop. Now, what we found, let me go through this very briefly, what we found is that there were nine dimensions that, against which market access strategies could be compared. And just let me just pick a couple out rather than, I'm not going to read, the, read them all, but you know, one of them, for instance, is um, the degree to which market access strategy anticipates change in the market. One of them is the degree to which your market access strategy understands, um, fits in with the life cycle of your product. Um, one of them is uh, the degree to which it recognises the heterogeneity of the market. Okay. Um, the, one to, the, the key one, of course, is a, good, a strong market access strategy offers health economic value in the eyes of the peer. For instance. So there's a, there was a whole set of these. And, and the beauty of these, of course, is that what we got out of the data wasn't just these, but we also got descriptions of, well, we're good at this when our market access strategy does this, and we're bad at this, F, for instance. We're good at F when we do this, and we're bad at F when we do that. Because all of the companies, of course, that I interviewed were quite large and they'd all had experience of many, many market access strategies. So we have nine dimensions. And that allowed us, of course, to develop a scale. Okay, so that what you see in that, that left-hand column, which is so hard to read there, is just the same words that you read in the previous slide. Okay, they're the nine factors. And what, what we set about doing was constructing a, a, a qualitative scale where you could describe what good, bad or indifferent were for each of those nine dimensions. Okay. In fact, in my research work and, what we, and what, when I work with companies, we have a five-point scale. Um, for reasons of brevity and simplicity, we're going to work with a three-point scale tonight, but it was a five-point scale. Um, and what we were able to do was paint a picture of what good, bad and indifferent looked like along each of these nine dimensions. So that you could look at your own market access strategy and say, well, according to dimension C, Looking at that line of descriptions, the, the, most, the, the description which most accurately fits our market access strategy for our brand is two. And on dimension D, it's five, and so on. Okay. And that led us to this. Okay. So if you think that pre preceding slide was had too many words on, this is much, much worse. And of course, I'm not expecting you to read this. You're going to get this in a moment in your handout. So 
But the aim of showing you this slide is simply that you get some idea as to how you do it. You, if you look along any one of those lines, you'll see a gradation of descriptions. Okay? And what we find with this, and even better with a five-point scale, that companies are able to look, you know, write down their market access strategy, then look along this line and say, well, if we're honest with ourselves, this is, this is where we are. And that leads me to the, the secondary value of doing this, of course, because as well as with some degree of ob objectivity measuring the strength or the strength profile of your market access strategy, it has this benefit of um, allowing you to discuss it on rational, objective terms within your team. Or if you do it within a company across multiple brands, transferring ideas between brand teams, and that's where the great value comes from. And this is interesting because when we came up with that original list of nine criteria and we showed them to the research respondents, they said, yeah, that all makes complete sense. So, so how do you test for these things at the moment? Well, we don't. And it turns out that market access, probably because it lies at the interstices, of, at, the, at the boundaries of multiple functions, and probably because it's so important to the success of a brand, it's the market access strategy is an especially politicised process. And it's, it's, it's quite often judged in a very, sub, if it's judged at all, in a very subjective and then uh, in a politicised way. Okay? And of course, what we were trying to do is get a, a testing process which took out the politics and took out the subjectivity and gave you, as well as you could, a, an objective test method. Yeah. Sorry, excuse me, I don't understand what you mean by uh, a, a politicised judgment. And I, I'm wondering how you got to the conclusion that that's why it's not judged properly. Okay. In the research, we asked questions like, um, how do you know whether your market access strategy is good or not? And how do you reach the decision to do this versus this? Okay? And the answer that came back in the interviews was, um, it was um, the result of the person who had power deciding this, or it was the result of a political compromise between person A and person B. Okay? So, if you, if you define politics as um, the use of power in organisations, which is a fairly standard definition of politics, when I say politicised, I mean a decision that is reached as a result of internal power dynamics as opposed to on a rational basis. Does that make sense? Okay. So, you know, it, as academics, we use, when we use words like politicised, we mean them in a very specific way, you know. So, but at this point, I would have put in a health warning. Because it's a politicised process, and because this process is effectively a, a, not one of where you can measure things in a, an extremely quantified way, but you're making a series of guided value judgments, it's extremely easy to screw this up. And one of the things we saw is when we handed this across to the companies that we did the research in, is they ran away and tried to do it. And you know, in the nicest possible way, they screwed it up. Because, of course, you have to understand what you're doing. It, you know, using this tool, if you don't really know what you're doing, is a little bit like giving me a power drill. You know, as, as my wife will tell you all, I am the world's worst DIY person. So if you give me, a DIY, give me a power drill, it doesn't allow me to do it better. It just allows me to screw it up faster and better. And it's a little bit like this with this tool with, with teams that aren't trained to do it. They, they still screw it up. And the problem is they now have a... A, an imprimatur, a, a stamp that says, oh, well, we had a scientific process applied to this, so it must be right. So getting the wrong decision, but with a, a barge of credibility is better than having a, is worse than having a, a bad decision without a barge of credibility. So this one comes with a health warning. It's a sort of don't try this at home type thing. The output of this process is something like this, a, a radar chart. So these nine axes that you see in the radar chart are those nine dimensions that you saw in the chart nine dimensions that you, you saw in my, my slide. Okay? And you were able to judge them using the chart and get a brand profile. So if you look at the green line on this chart, for instance, you'll see that they were particularly strong on, on um, characteristic A and particularly weak on characteristic E. Okay? And, and different brands are different profiles. Again, it comes back to this, this secondary value during this process is you're able to compare brands within your company and say, What's this brand doing well that we could, could apply to that brand? 
Yeah? And it facilitates internal knowledge transfer. Yeah? And it's even better when you get brand teams to challenge each other, of course, because they'll say, hang on, you give yourself an A and we think you're only a C. You, know, you give yourself a, a, a high mark on A and we think you should get a, a medium or a low mark and you're forced to justify yourself. But according to not just politics or not just subjective opinions, according to a, a, a rational scale. So this is what the output looks like. And of course, the great benefit of this is it's, it's, it's to improve your market access strategy always requires some kind of resource, always requires some sort of effort. Now, if you look at A, um, at, um, at the green brand on this one, for instance, so it was uh, brand 11 in, in, our, in our work, there's probably not much point in trying to improve dimension A, okay, or dimension F but you can make a relatively large impact on the strength of your market access strategy by trying to improve dimension E or um, dimension H. Okay? So it allows you to focus the efforts of your market access team. So in practice, when we use this, we see benefits of you get an objective assessment, you get internal um, transfer of brand competencies and challenge, depoliticization of the process, and importantly, if you're, if you're a market access leader, you get a, a clear steer as to where you should be focusing your effort. Okay. So, we're, that is, in essence is how the process works. Um, but I can stand here and talk forever about this and it, it still won't get it across to you. The, the best way that we're going to do this, I suggest, is that you have a go at this with a brand that you're familiar with. What I'm going to do is give you some handouts that allow you to do that. I'm going to ask you to either work individually or, or with a partner, whatever you want to do, um, and think of a brand that you're familiar with. Many of you have written to, those I knew were coming, I've written to in advance and gave you some warning of this. Think of a brand you're familiar with, and I'm going to ask you to write it, your market access strategy, and I'm going to ask you to judge yourself according to these scales, look at these scales. Now, of course, you won't get it right. Remember, the objective this evening is not to get the right result. The objective this evening is to learn the process. Yeah? And then when we've all done that, I'm going to ask you, and you don't need to say what your brand is, you can keep it confidential, I'm going to ask you to write it on here. I'm going to see what you look like. That okay with you? Mm -hmm. Okay? Right, in that case, I'll shut up and we'll get into the workshop. Thank you.